Howdy team, welcome to another episode of the Pro Podcast. Today I've got an interview for you with an absolute legend across many different stages, literally, uh, from property investing to entrepreneur to two times public speaking world record holder, podcaster, mum, wife, <laughs> an absolute legend in JV finance raising as well. Tony, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. How are you doing? I'm good. Although I feel like I need to lie down after you've introduced me like that. I didn't realise <laughs> yeah. just how much I actually do. I need a holiday. I am very, <laughs> very well. Thank you for asking. Good. And it's lovely to actually see you properly again because we haven't seen each other for ages. So long. It's good to see that you're all still alive, kicking, doing well when it comes to business and podcasting. Yeah. And thank you very much for giving up your time today. So really what we're going to dive into is, is a little bit of everything that I mentioned in the intro, hopefully. Um, but what was your, going right back to kind of the beginning for you, what was kind of your first journey into business or property, whichever came first? Well, property came first um and if we go kind of way back my first foray into it which not a lot of people know unless I've told them the story is that actually I was an accidental landlord back in 2007 zero desire to invest in property um zero knowledge when it came to the property market it was a necessity thing so um I'll give you the abridged version otherwise the podcast will go on forever I bought a house kind of 50 minutes from where I live with the then partner zero knowledge of the property market, bought at the height, paid far too much. Um, long story short, I was then left with a house in negative equity and a partner who was sent packing. So I had, I took in a lodger, hated that, rented out the property and made a grand total of minus £50-ish per month renting the property out. So that was my kind of first step into business and property, which led to me believing that I wasn't cut out for either. <laughs> um and then it was a long time, fast forward into kind of 2014-ish, when my husband said that we should start investing in property. And really, honestly, I thought we'd go along to some property training events to learn how to do it and also realise what I've done wrong. But I thought what it would do would cement the idea that it's not for us. And I found a whole different side to a property business and me. So I started investing uh, kind of early 2015 in property. And... It was tough times to begin with, but um, with the right people around me, I got some education and some some lessons the hard way. And um, we built up quite a substantial portfolio, so that was my kind of first step into property was making lots of mistakes, and then second time round, realizing if I wanted to do it, I had to do it a completely different way. And what was the big mindset shift that you had between those two? You said you had training, but was what was the kind of the big shift for you then to go from making loads of mistakes to then making it work? Do you know what? A big driving force was actually my husband. I don't give him anywhere near as much credit as he deserves. So it was actually Chris's Chris. desire to invest in property. Yeah, just sitting in the background, making the wheels turn and me standing at the forefront, taking all of the credit. Um, it was actually, we used to rent a house, a gorgeous little cottage, an old school house, Um and we rented it and we asked, could we buy it? And the landlord said, no, he only rents it out. And then he used to come and collect the rent. <laughs> Probably shouldn't be saying that, but he used to come and physically collect the rent, uh, which obviously he automatically banked. Um, and Chris had kind of come every to every month and Chris started talking to him, asking a little bit about it. And he realised that he had almost 40 properties. And when Chris done the maths on it, realised that was probably much more lucrative than a job. So that was what really got us started kind of thinking about it. So I suppose the mindset shift was firstly having my husband alongside me. So not that I'm saying you have to, you know, invest with a partner, but just having someone who was there to kind of go through the highs and the lows, that was a huge part. And I think the mindset shift for me was definitely around money because I'd always kind of, without realising, had a bit of a scarcity around money. I'd grown up being told, you know, you want something you work really hard for it. You've got to save up all of these different things. And then kind of getting into a network where that wasn't the done thing. It was like we're shying away from that completely. You make your own look. You create your own destiny. Anyone can set up a business. And I think when you hear enough of that, initially I just completely you know, thought thought it was a load of rubbish. I just thought it wasn't for the likes of me, you know. So being surrounded by it, you hear something often enough, it piques your interest enough to investigate it a little bit further. And I think once I dove into that world of improving your personal development, improving your mindset, taking a lot of your belief from others and what they've achieved, everything changed. 
Yeah, it's so funny you say that. And in the back of my mind, I'm sitting there going, just remembering the time my dad turned around to me and said, like, money doesn't grow on trees, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's but like, it used you know, to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Literally did. Yeah, this is made the a thing. Paper. <laughs> Back when we were told that money doesn't grow on trees, mine was, uh, my dad was a plasterer. He used to be out first thing in the morning, not last thing at night. He'd sit in a room with zero light on. The light would go on when he wanted to read. And I'd walk around the house, turn the lights on all of the time. It's like Blackpool illuminations in here. Do you know how much it costs? <laughs> the irony being, you have no idea how much it costs until you become an adult and start paying your own bills. But I think all of those little negative things that you hear, they seep in whether you believe it or not, and they set you up for life, either for right or for wrong. And that, that was a massive realisation for me within the first 12 months, I think, of, of getting into business was looking at how differently people perceive things. I think perception plays a massive part. And I'd be surrounded by people for whom, you know, investing in things wasn't an issue, investing in themselves, spending time on themselves. All of those things was like worlds away from what I've been told and what I'd seen. You know, working really hard, extra jobs, always busy, providing for everyone else, putting yourself last. And I think that mindset shift, it's an ongoing thing. It never stops, does it? You don't just fix it once. No, that's it. I, I love the saying new level, new devil. It's like every time yeah. you, you take on another property or another employee or, you know, you, you do something new that's slightly outside of your comfort zone. You're always finding and attracting, you know, difficult mindset shifts. And obviously Absolutely. one of our one of our mutual mentors has the saying, which is, you know, the mindset, no, the skill set without the mindset leads to upset. Um, and I absolutely love that because it's so bloody true. Yeah. Um, but I was, it's funny that you say it as well, because I was having a conversation with a person very close to me. I'll say nameless just in case. Um, but it was about the the fact that he likes to buy, a tradesperson, likes to buy yep. everything cash. I was like, but... And this is the, you know, the mentality of employee mindset is where I would put it. But if you go and buy your car for cash or this for cash, technically, if you were able to, you know, purchase it and it might cost you 4% to get some finance or something on those kind of lines. But if you take that cash and reutilize that, as I said to him in your business, you know, put it into another employee, it means you can do twice the amount of work. Technically, that all of a sudden gives you more income. You know, is that the same mentality that you kind of have realised within property? Definitely. I think, again, that comes down to perception, what you've heard, what you've seen or what you're used to doing. We do what's comfortable. We do what we've seen and heard. You know, we, we replicate that again and again. And I think that's a huge, it's an education point, isn't it, around understanding leverage and how you can actually go further and faster when you do leverage that money. Because this comes to something where, you know, I, and it was something I was guilty of. I'd always look at the cost of things. So in that instance, friend, family member, whoever that might be, is looking at the cost of the 4%, but what they're missing is the opportunity cost of that money going there, they're being recycled. And, you know, we're talking cheesy quotes, and I love the Craig Van Dyne quote, the skill set without the mindset one. But the other one is you don't look at the cost of the shovel when you're digging for gold. And I think yeah. that being that we worry about investing a little bit of money in or spending money on an interest rate for something, but not looking. And I think that comes down to a plan, doesn't it? I think if you're yeah. looking at it from the perspective of, I can go and pay cash for it. You know, the, there's no stress there. I owe nobody anything, which was the mind I was always told, you never get in debt, all debt's bad. And I think that's a mindset shift, isn't it? Is education point, understanding the difference between the different types of debt, understanding leverage versus paying for things you can't afford. So, and I get that mentality and the old me used to do that. But I think now I'm a huge fan, like I'll never buy a car outright. I'll always leverage the finance and I do that with properties to a level that you're comfortable with. Yeah, and you said leveraging it or doing the same with property as well. You know, if you think back to your first foray into property you know the, you said you made lots of mistakes at that point in time I know many people listening to this would like to get into property but have that fear um, of <laughs> buying the wrong thing or buying at the wrong time particularly at the time of recording this when we've been sitting <laughs> waiting for a crash for god knows how long and interest rates are on the rise um, you know what's kind of your advice to somebody who's starting out or wanting to get into their property journey in the next 12, 24, 18 months, depending on how this world plays out. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's exciting times personally because I'm a huge believer, you know, you and I have known each other long enough now that you believe in not just building wealth and support and a network and a great life for you, but for other people. And I think a lot of that, again, comes down to perception because people will say in today's market, you know, you're taking advantage of, of people who are struggling, you know, or, you know, the buy to let don't stack up or whatever. And I think that's because that's what you hear on mainstream media and yet you've got to experience it. The, the big difference between me investing first time round was I didn't have anybody around me at all who was doing it, who was investing in property that I could just kind of go, I'm doing this right, get a bit of a sanity check, ask for advice. You know, and that's why I love what you've set up is this advice forum for people in so many different contexts, because so often you hear the one thing said by many different people, which surrounded me was never get into debt. You know, <laughs> I'm going to buy another property. What do you want one of them for, girl? You've already got one. You know, it was it was a completely different mindset. So I think it was about creating a network who understand what it is that you're doing. I yeah. personally think, you know, the time of recording this and even for the next 12, 18 months, we've got some really, really exciting times ahead to help and support those who aren't as educated as we are in property, the market and when to buy and when not to buy. You know, you can I bought at the height of the market and I bought at the quietest part. And it all works as long as you're in it long term and have a plan. And I think, you know, everyone had a bit of a stress about it. I'm refinancing a load of properties right now. And you could say it's the wrong time to do it, but it's the right time within my business. And because I've got such good advice and support around me, I'm actually my plan is to start buying even more you know I'm not I'm always really honest and say I'm not the biggest fan in terms of the day-to-day of property don't love the nuts and bolts of it it's a vehicle for income long-term generational wealth and actually it's one of the most stable things that you will ever invest in it's cheesy but it's true safe as houses and the market's always going to go up and down but it does in every other market and this is the one that's kind of longest serving there's always going to be a demand for houses so I think now is a really good time for people to start getting to know and understand what that the market is always going to fluctuate and just finding the kind of right route for each person because it's not one size fits all um but for me you know a little bit of fear is a good thing because it does serve you well stop you jumping into big deals without any diligence but how many people have waited it's the cost opportunity cost thing isn't it again oh it's expensive time so i'll wait until the interest rates drop i'll wait till property prices drop and they never do what you're expecting them to do still waiting for the recession we could (laughs) wait forever and you've missed so many opportunities during that time so you know get a bit of knowledge around it make a decision mitigate your risks as best as you can with the best advice that you can and just do it Definitely. You know, they say the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, whereas, you know, the best time technically to just plant a tree or buy a property or invest in yourself, whatever it is, is basically now, isn't it? Yes. The longer you wait, the the compound effect is just being delayed from that point of view. Yeah. Um, but you said there in terms of your you've got properties yourself coming to the end of deals that, you know, you're needing to refinance and everything else. How are you handling from an investor point of view, you know, the mindset shift of, what I would assume was a much, much lower interest rate that based on current climate is currently probably doubling somewhere along those kind of lines. You know, what's what's your thought as an investor when you're seeing that? Because that will be putting people off at the moment. Some will be sitting saying, oh, yeah, but interest rates will come back down a little bit. So I'm going to wait until that happens. Others will be sitting there saying, oh, yeah, but there's going to be a recession. So I'll buy when the market bottoms out. <laughs> Others will be saying, you know, interest rates are too high to buy. What's your kind of, how are you handling that mindset of low rates now going to higher rates? Don't get me wrong. There were days when I was like, we've missed the boat. We were really fortunate and I'm touching wood at this point because in the process of refinancing a big chunk of the portfolio and we managed to get some really good interest rates. So they were secured in the fours. So we've been really fortunate. However, you know, I've got another, what, 15 or so coming to fruition in the next couple of months. And we're at the point of looking at what is the best thing to do. Um, one, none of us know what's going to happen. I'm not an economist by any means, but I've watched the markets go up and down. And also, I think, you know, I'm buying at each point within the market. I'll stress test differently. I'll ensure that we meet the requirements of the lenders because we buy cash and then we refinance a little bit later on. But I've spent a lot of time, you know, I'm one of those people who did study economics, so I have a bit of a grasp on it. It wasn't very good and it'll never profess to be, but I understand a little bit. And also, I understand that the market's ever changing. So for me, it's take the best deal at the time and then hedge against it. You know, if a deal, for depending on how you're buying. So interest rates right now, yes, they've increased. Mortgage interest rates have increased. But me personally, and I, you know, I'm not a tax advisor, but me personally, 
I can see that they are going to drop because you look at what happened when the last Bank of England rate change occurred. You know, fixed rate mortgages started bottoming out a little bit, slowing down a little bit, staying where they were. And that tells me that there's some kind of certainty within the market because the lenders are getting their money from somewhere. They've got to loan it out. They can't sit with it in their back pockets. They're still paying for it. And when you said, um, you know, it's going to be putting a lot of people off selfishly. I'm quite excited for that. Those of you who are too scared to do it, you just sit there and wait. You wait till it bottoms out, by which point I'll have bought a load of those properties. You know, I'll have negotiated the deals because what's going to happen, in in my opinion, is we're going to see demand for those properties decrease because people are sitting on the hands a little bit of being a bit fearful, which means the demand for the properties is decreasing, but actually the supply of those properties is massively increasing. People are downsizing. People can't afford their own mortgages. And we're in a really privileged position in what we do to help those people. You can house them in your other houses. You can help them downsize. You can help them scale back while also getting a great deal. So I think over the next few months, we're going to see demand decrease, supply increase, and basic economics tells us that interest rates will come down. And because we're buying and holding for a little while before we refinance, buy cash now, still better than, you know, your money sitting in a bank at a low interest rate. And by the time we come to refinance, I believe that the interest rates will be lower. And even if they're not, because we're buying discounted, you can effectively get assets really cheap or for free. So the cash flow is irrelevant over time because we're building a buffer up of equity. So yeah, I think it's really exciting times. I think people who hold off too long will actually miss the boat and they'll be sitting here in another five years' time going, remember when we could have bought at 7 8% interest rates? <laughs> 100%. I always think back to, you know, uh, when I was probably 18 years old and was in Colchester and there was flats at Claremont Heights next to the train station, which were like 35, 40 grand, <sighs> you know, which now, what, being 41, um, they're probably 260, 270 grand. The rental income would be astronomical. They would cash flow really well. You'd have bought multi, you'd have had mu so much equity to be able to pull out. And property on average goes up consistently all the time, doesn't it? Do you know but, what? And, and I think it's using that to fuel. You know, being the person who I missed the boat, I should have done it. So because I missed the boat then, well, that yeah. was the best time to buy. So I'm not going to do it. It's looking at where are we going to be in another, you know, 10, 20 years time. And those properties that we're looking at now, which will have again doubled or trebled or wherever it is in terms of, you know, the inflation taken into consideration that that we're, we're always going to see drops in it as well it's forgetting that you know we look at the you're looking at the i could have bought at 18 at 35 grand i could buy them now at 200 but we're forgetting that during that it bottomed out and the property prices massively dropped but during yeah. that time the rents were still being collected in fact they probably increased and have done incrementally over time so i think it's about the way in which you buy as well you know a lot of people are jumping in at, and I'm seeing that now even you know prices have dropped a little bit I'm going to buy but they're not doing due diligence they're not looking at the end cause so if your plan is to buy with a mortgage or your plan is to refinance onto a mortgage it's being realistic and asking your brokers your lenders you know what the stress testing at and just go a little bit above it so that at least they wash their face because as you say in time they're all going to go up and everyone's yeah. going to say remember when we could have bought that yeah yeah. And you're so right in the sense that it's doing your due diligence. I talk about I talk to people all the time about this as a broker. And it's like, you know, yes, the cash flow is important. Yes, your percentage of returns important. But equally, if you're buying lower, then capital growth is also a consideration. But there's many pieces of the puzzle to work yeah. out as you know, as well as, you know, thinking longer term rather than just the next couple of years. But yeah. many people listening to this might be at that stage and i know you're an expert in this area where they're going oh yeah but at the moment i just haven't got the cash you know? <laughs> i've definitely been the expert at that just <laughs> not having the cash <laughs> you know so for anyone who's currently sitting there for example to give you context a mortgage advisor who's sitting there listening to this with an absolute client bank of people who you know have bought their own residential home or have some cash that perhaps they're sitting on you know how do they leverage that to their advantage 
So I have massive gratitude for those people who do leverage it because they're the ones who built my portfolio for me, straight loans, joint ventures. And I think it's, again, I'm, I've said the same a million times over and over, and it's all about perspective because I think sometimes we go, oh, we're going to save for a rainy day. I'm keeping that money as a little war chest. But when you're saving for a rainy day, you're only going to get a rainy day. What's the plan and where are you going to use it? We've all learned the hard way that, you know, there's so much uncertainty in the world. It's not just the market. And yet we, you know, we were told during 2020, 2021, prices are going to drop, et cetera. Rents are going to drop. Yet we saw prices skyrocket and rents increase. And I think it's it's understanding that those in the financial markets are in a really privileged position because you're getting to meet all of these people, you're getting to help and advise them. And I think the money sat in the bank is, is earning nothing. Leverage the right way with the right due diligence, you know, investing into property, investing into assets, bricks and mortar that are going to increase in value, or borrowing funds from other people. Again, massive due diligence required. But, you know, for me, my whole portfolio was built using other people's money and it was helping them to get wealthy too. So there's so many of those financial advisors, mortgage brokers who are helping other people get wealthy, but they've got a massive pot of money, not necessarily theirs, but other people's that they can tap into, help themselves, help other people. And that's, that's something I'm massively passionate about is creating that win-win situation. And again, that came to a mindset shift because, you know, I remember having a conversation with one of my mentors kind of around the, well, if I'm finding good deals, I want to buy them all. I don't want to share them with anyone. But that shared risk, shared reward, joint venturing, built up other people's portfolios for them, built a massive amount of trust, and then are my investors so that when we find the good deals, we'll either straight loan or joint venture with them. So I think understanding leverage is huge within any market in business, but particularly in the property market and the financial market. Every lender who's putting money into something has usually borrowed that at a lower rate elsewhere. So it's been happening forever. We just kind of don't get taught this, which is why I love that you're educating people around this, because if people like you were not educating all of these other brokers and financial professionals, they do the same thing over and over and over and get, you know, relatively wealthy, but also, again, that missed opportunity. I believe that we've got an opportunity to every for everyone to win. And I think when you think of it from that kind of mindset, it's huge. So for those who haven't got the context that you and I have got to, to what you've just discussed, you know, we call this JV finance effectively. Mm -hmm. So for the layman who's sitting there going, oh, okay, I've got a client bank and they might have some cash and there's a win-win in it for both of us. And, oh, I could leverage that cash and I buy the property. How do you describe JV finance to them? And then how would it work for them on a, on a basic level? Yeah. So, um, I'm a very simple creature. <laughs> I talk things in simple terms and I look at it at two parts of a jigsaw puzzle. Right now, there is someone sat there with money in their bank earning not a huge amount or a client base with money in their bank earning not a huge amount. And for those like me, when I first started investing, I was like, oh, poor you, you've got money sat in the bank and it's doing nothing. It might be a champagne problem, but it's still a problem because that money is eroding in value due to inflation. So you're helping them to use their money. The other side of the coin is where there's a surplus of money in someone's bank account, there's a deficit of something. And in this instance, it's probably the knowledge around property investing or the access to the deals. In that instance, there's someone out there with a deficit, usually money. So if we're looking two parts of a jigsaw puzzle piece, excess money, not enough money, create more with less. You know, this side, although they've got a deficit of money, they've actually got a surplus of knowledge or time where someone else hasn't. So it's, it's creating the two parts together, just going so much further, so much faster. So in its simplest terms, when I invest in JV finance, when I'm loaning or borrowing funds or JV in, two ways that we do it. We borrow those funds at an interest rate agreed. So we borrow the funds, client basis money sat in the bank, utilize it to buy property, add value, and then repay them back with an interest rate on top. Or if they, that client base are looking to build their portfolio, we let them leverage our knowledge, our database, our network, our deals, etc. So they fund the deal. Ours is the sweat equity part of it. So each of us putting in our own skill set, and then we jointly own. So we buy it, we add value. Upon refinance, paying back, you know, usually all, but ideally in an ideal world, that is when the market's a little bit hotter, a big chunk of the investment back, but they've got an asset. So it's lever each party leveraging the missing part of their jigsaw puzzle piece. And when you look at it that way, it is so simple. 
Yeah. It is actually, I mean, it's not easy. It takes a little bit of legwork, but it's something that once you've done once, like everything else just gets easier and it becomes the norm. And I think for people in our world, that is normal. But yeah. to those who are maybe listening in thinking, mm, what's the catch? The catch is knowing how to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And we have so many clients who who do that. You know, they'll use a limited company SPV and the money can go in as a director's loan and there can be guarantees in place, obviously, depending Absolutely. on the lender and all that jazz. Um, but it's a great way to, you know, leverage someone else's cash that's sitting there doing nothing, pay them an annual return. And then you go and do the legwork of finding the property, refurb the property, refinance the property and so on. Yeah. Um, and as you said, that's how you've scaled quite rapidly, I suppose. No way we'd have done it without other people and without that kind of ability to leverage yeah. others and them leverage us. And we've done it in so many different ways. Their SP, an SPV, their limited company, our limited company, no financial tie at all and a straight loan, just loan funds again with those types of security. You know, you can offer first charges. So it's better than someone kind of trying to piece together, you know, yourself, you know, a lender's not going to like you taking a 75% loan to value mortgage and borrowing the funds from, you know, Bob down the road. But if Bob down the road has the full amount, why not give him a better to return you buy it cash you give him first charge so there's even more than everyone wins it's actually it, it's literally been the catalyst for our property business starting let alone growing it's been the catalyst for the entire business yeah and it's something that so many people in property leverage once they understand it um yeah. because you say that's the key thing is, is getting your head around it first of all education's kind of key yeah where do you where do you put in your development the you know education side of things because i know that's for my industry it's something that's relatively new you know you come out yeah. of a job you've got these things that you've got these beliefs from when you're younger um, i didn't get into personal development business development investing in myself you know until 2016 having been in business already for 10 years you know how do you prioritize that in terms of your own education your own journey your own development etc it's paramount in my opinion you know I'll always say as you know public speaking is a huge passion of mine so I stand on stages and I say this and I believe that they that it's in the top three things that you need to be successful in any area of life particularly in business property and entrepreneurship education mindset which we've already touched upon and network you know those experts in those fields like everyone listening to this podcast and right now is leveraging your knowledge and your network your time and whoever you bring in to interview if you're bringing in an interview um I think if you have those three things right at the forefront a good education is paramount for me because I learned the hard way you know you make your mistakes or you earn or you learn and I yeah. learned a lot from the first time round of investing but again I didn't know what I was doing and I didn't have anyone around me who was doing it I didn't know where to get the education which is why I think it's it's great that people are tapping into this now for me education is paramount without it you're going to make a lot of mistakes but also that network and the mindset being kind of right up there it's in the top three skill sets I think that you need in any business it's it's paramount and you mentioned public speaking there where where did you suddenly realize you know to give people context as well I did my public speaking course was it I don't think it was with you actually was it mm, I did the training I, think I did the training you did in the training December. in Yes. In 2017, but you were yeah. my mentor through 2018. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, 2019. yeah. So it was kind of, that was when I was, I've, I've been into public speaking since 2015. And I'm really honest with people when I say I'm not a huge fan of property. I know that sounds ridiculous because I'm talking all things property and I'm buying quite aggressively. But that's because I see it as a vehicle to give you cash flow and time to do more of what you love, which for me is public speaking. But actually, yeah. when I first, got the bug for it was sitting at a property event and thinking I'm not massively interested in the property stuff but I see the need for it but I'd love to do what you do and it was Peter Jones who was the trainer at the time yeah. um so I jumped into my public not a huge amount of time ahead of you to be honest 2015 is when I done my public speaking training and then went straight on to a mentorship program and I've been mentored ever since and it's so oh, 2000 and mid 2015 um and now, as you say, I mentor other people in it because I just, I love it. I think it's a skill set that everyone has and most people have it innate inside of them. Um, but not, I don't think people realise just how important it is when it comes to building a business and when it comes to being an entrepreneur is it's all communication. 
Yeah. And it's, it's not just for me, it was even, you know, my content even got better on social media after 2017, because all of a sudden I had a framework and I had a, a structure and a way of speaking and, you know, understanding tonality and I'd done some body language stuff and things like that before, but being able to, you know, slow it down and quieten it down if you need, or, you know, speed it up and get really excited mm -hmm. or energetic. Um, but what point did you, you realize being in a property event that you wanted to be on a property stage? How has that impacted your business since not just becoming a trainer, but actually into your property business and, and real life business? I think it's what was a catalyst for me feeling confident enough to do the joint ventures. Because I think when you come to raising finance and joint ventures, you can understand the theory around it, but then you've actually got to put it into practice like anything else in life. And you might be able to sit at home and, you know, pitch for finance or create a slide deck that tells everyone what you do. But I think the ability to communicate it. So I actually believe that the two things, the education and the ability to communicate fused together is what supercharged it. So it was really early on that I realised how, you know, even in everyday life, I was a HR manager. I was communicating with people 24 seven, but similarly to you, once I'd done the, the speaker education side of it, it changed everything. It changed my relationships with family members and friends and the way I communicate with them. It changed the way I um, dealt with my employees as a, as a senior leader, a senior manager. And I started implementing all of these things, like the way that my content was delivered, same content, just a different, more engaging way. Or I come up with these ideas to get everyone involved and it, it, it shifted everything and results in the job sense started to improve. Then the confidence improves. And I love the cycle that it creates because when you're more confident, you get better results and that obviously boosts your confidence so it helped me to raise the finance and feel comfortable standing up and speaking out at events it's you know it, it's the core of I think any business so I think once I got the bug for it because I got the bug very early on um I realized kind of it's it, I, you know I, I used the framework that we teach you I used it to get my kids to brush their teeth when they didn't want to to I've get my husband to take the right. bins out <laughs> honestly it's when you realize it it was like boom, like bulb moment of wow it's actually not just what you say it's how you say it and you can elegantly sell or get people to do things the best feeling in the world is when you get someone to do something you want them to do and then then thank you for it like, yeah that's all down to the way it's pitched and communicated so yeah um I, you can see my tonality and everything changes because i'm so passionate about the speaker side of it and you said there i know that lots of people you know have that thing of oh yeah but i don't like the sound of my voice on video or you know <laughs> oh, I, don't like, I don't like the sound of my own voice so i've got a face for radio or you know when i stand on stage people are going to judge me you know to people <laughs> who have those beliefs what would you say to them <laughs> that every one of us has and has had those you know they continue before we started recording I'm like oh I've got really bad hair today and you know have you heard my voice I remember having that fear who's gonna want to listen to me I'm from a rough council estate in Liverpool barely finished the ends of the words let alone start the next one and I think the best piece of advice I ever got from one of our mutual mentors is that people are going to judge you anyway so why not let them judge you for who you really are, what you stand for, what you stand against. The scariest thing is everyone's got a song, a book, information inside of them that too many people take to the grave. Um, and I'm a, a massive fan of Maya Angelou, the poet and historian. And there is a phrase that, it, I mean, it's a screensaver on my laptop and everything. And it says, people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but they'll never forget the way you made them feel. Yeah. And the fact that you've said something out loud, irrespective of the tonality or whether your hair looks right or you've got a face for radio or whatever, it's the imagine you haven't done that. You know, imagine you hadn't started doing what you're doing, putting out, you've been consistently putting out content since what, 2016, and it's been non stop. And I am certain there will have been days where you've kind of gone, oh, I can't really be bothered today, or I've got Most this going on in life. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that you, you've, you've committed to something, you've got a value to give. And I think it's the, the people are going to judge you anyway, that without a shadow of a doubt. But also, you know, if you've got information, knowledge, you know, even if you've got experience of something going really wrong and you don't share that with the world to either help them go further and faster or to stop them making the mistakes, you're doing them a disservice. There are too many people who've experienced bad things and not shared it with anyone or experienced success and not gone, here's the secret sauce. Imagine if we all lived in a world where that was the norm. 
sharing the good, sharing the bad, telling everyone what to do and what not to do, and not giving, I nearly swore, not giving a okay. damn. <laughs> it's punctuation where I come from. Um, but not caring what other people think, because if they're going to judge you anyway for what you wear, what you say, what you don't say, just do it anyway. And, you know, what will be will be. And I think once I realised that and I stopped trying to be the eternal people pleaser, everything changed for me. And I know it has done for many people that have been fortunate enough to mentor. Oh, definitely. And and obviously, as one of my mentors in or my mentor in public speaking over the years, you know, I always think back to the conversation that we had. And I reached out to you and Rob, funnily enough, just so I, you were saying, you know, you've just got to, you've almost got to embrace who you are and what's unique about you. And one of the best things you can do in those environments is just bring it to the forefront straight away and almost make a little bit of a joke out of it. Because then, you know, it's, it's like when you're at school, isn't it? It's playground tactics. If you take the mickey out of yourself, then no one can take the mickey out of that thing about you because you've already yes. technically done it. So you're not bothered. Yeah. Um, the cult, as is, that we call it, as is it. You know, if the way is like, let's say you look a certain way, you sound a certain way, you know that what you're sharing with people is so elevated by some but hated by others. Just call it out. It's the elephant in the room. So, you know, the first thing that I started doing was calling out my accent. Yes, I am from Liverpool. Yes, people normally take the money away from us, not offer it to us. And as you say, it's the school bully tactics. I've called it out. So you can say what you like about me, but I've owned it. And, you know, when we own the very thing about us that other people dislike, it's what makes us great. And, yeah, I think the more we encourage people to do that, imagine what a world we'd live in if this stuff was taught at schools. Oh, without a doubt. Like, Without a doubt. I don't know. I don't know. I haven't worked out yet, but my daughter is my eldest daughter, my 10 year old. She's like, it's been great because she's been, she's in year six now, but she's wanted to, she's got a whole tie full of badges of like all the little oh. things that she's gone for, but she, she had to do, she's had to do three presentations and I don't wow. know if it's because she's seen me doing some of mine or, you know, she's not been to any of my live events or anything at all like that. But obviously I come home and I talk about it quite a lot and yeah. I've helped her with the presentations and things like that. And we talk about the butterflies that you get beforehand and, you know, the, the difference between the, um, oh, it's escaped me. The, the fear is exactly the same emotion as excitement, yeah. isn't it? Is that yeah, the yeah, yeah. right way around, isn't it? It's the endorphins and the uh, the oxytocin that's released as well. And it's like the, the same fear. It's, again, it comes down to perception, isn't it? I love that your daughter is undoubtedly, it's, you know, seeing you doing it and that becoming the normal on a video, on a podcast, interviewing people, speaking up and speaking out. And they replicate that. I love the fact that she's doing it and, you know, that you're nurturing that inside. But I think there's lots of people out there who aren't having this nurtured or recognised. Yeah. And I get really excited when you hear people say, and, you know, they got up and they delivered a speech because it's not always just about that. It might just be about, you know, introducing themselves in a room where they feel a little bit uncomfortable. And I think if we nurture yeah. this in children, like, oh, my word, what, what, what a place we would live where everyone felt comfortable to speak up and speak out without fear of judgment or knowing that people are going to judge you but thinking, balls to it, caution to the wind, I'm going to do it and we'll see what happens. Um, and I think that even if we don't physically say that to people, she's seen you do that and it becomes the norm. And if we make stuff like that the norm, imagine what the next generation are going to do. We're going to be left for dust. <laughs> oh, without a doubt. And I said to my kids the other day, it's that whole thing of, you know, my, my job as a parent is to make sure that realistically you do better than I done. Yes. You know, and to help Give you the to achieve that. So it's like 2015 when I think it might, it was either 2015 or 2016 when I was number 28 out of 30 people in a room and I had my little 30 second elevator pitch that I needed to do. You know, hi, I'm Gary and I'm a mortgage broker. But <laughs> I, I can, it doesn't do it anymore. But it used, even just saying that would make the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. And I remember having sweaty palms and a little bit of a sweaty back and all that kind of thing. And then funnily enough, I went to a property event in 2016 and I saw people on the stage and I thought I'd love to be able to do that. And then within a year, I was, you know, a year, 18 months, I was yeah. I was on the training. And it's really, I think it's really important. If there's something you want to do that you don't know how to do, just find somebody who's doing it and invest in the education to do it. That's what we've done since we were kids and we crawled, yeah. you know, we, we ended up walking because we just saw our parents or our uh, uh, siblings or whatever walking and, and we've just learned vicariously through observation but there's ways in which you can learn all of these skills to, to take it to the next level 
and I'd say without a shadow of a doubt, it's the fact that as a baby, as a child, there is no fear. We don't care what they're going to say or do. That's a, that's a learned trait. You mm. know, the fear of standing up in front of someone, the fear of expressing your opinion, they're all learned traits. Because how many times have, have you been out with the kids and they've said something out loud that you're thinking, oh, my God, we don't say those things because it's come into their head. But there's no fear. There's no malice. There's no, you know, issue with it. But they just say what comes into the head. And, you know, yes, there's got to be some limitations on that. But the learned traits also err onto the side of learning not to speak up, learning to blend into the background and, you know, learning that we shouldn't say this and we shouldn't do that because people might judge us. So it's something I'm hugely passionate about. And I love that you instill it. In, in the kids to go forward because yeah our job is to keep them safe and to give them the best opportunity but I also think that's what we're doing with our mentees isn't it keep you safe from the world but also expose you to the things that you need to know and get you out of your own way we're nine times out of ten we are the bottleneck in our own business no matter what your business is we're the bottleneck because of fear doubt worry concern and I think people are going to judge you anyway so let them judge you for being an amazing success who stands up and stands out Definitely. And that's tomorrow, funnily enough, at the time recording this, I've got my pro mastermind community coming together. And as, because we're at the year end, I've challenged them all to do a five to seven minute talk on one Love strategy it. or one tactic that's worked really well for their business this year. So we've we've given them basic frameworks they can use and stuff like that. Haven't said, don't worry about slides, just waffle on and get over that first anxiety because the first time is always the cha- the most challenging one. Yep. Um, but yeah, it's 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 pushing their comfort zones, which is why you join these things at the end of the day, isn't it? And how much they're going to learn vicariously from one another, both from the content of they're doing that in their business, I could replicate that, but also yep. from their delivery of it. It's that, you know, it, it's as old as time, isn't it? A mastermind. It's the Napoleon Hill days when those two words were separate, but we fused them together. It's a mastermind, that hive mind to share success, share challenges. And, you know, we're doing that with these podcasts, which is why after about a year out of podcasting, I've agreed to come on yours because I just love everything that you're doing. And I think you're doing amazing things and I'm honoured that you've invited me. Ah, oh, thank you very much indeed for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I have to, I have a little confession for you, Tony, as well. And anyone, <laughs> anyone who has been to one of my events that I run, um, and obviously through 2020 and 2021, for reasons we all know, there wasn't as many as I would have liked. Yeah. But when we get to a break, there is something that I always say, and I don't say that I own it, but can you guess what it is, Tony? <laughs> Teas and wheeze. <laughs> and I say it's, I literally say it all the time. I'm like, right, time for teas and wheeze, people. And then uh, it's true, can... though, isn't it? We're just stating fact. What do you yeah, do yeah. during the break? You have a debate. What do I need more, the tea or the wee? And that will decide the order. So steal away. <laughs> <laughs> I've always credited, so it's absolutely fine. But I thought to let you know, every speaking gig I do, you're oh, always technically with me. You I know? feel like I'm always there. <laughs> Hopefully, I'm the angel on your shoulder and not the devil. Well, probably a bit of both at times because there's a reason why I'm hypercritical of the way I which I am because I just think of all the feedback that I've had over the years. Sorry about that. <laughs> but that's how we get better, isn't it? You you only learn from the mistakes that you make. It's it's that's the the crazy thing. And I think you know the the time that we've had together where you've reviewed presentations or you've watched me speak and then give that feedback. That's the whole benefit of coaching, mentoring, communities, groups, mentors, etc. Because that education gets you the result much quicker, doesn't it? Yeah, it's the the fastest route. It's the route of least, least resistance. Yeah. But um, also what I would say, though, because I know that you mentor and coach many a person, is that you also got so much out of it because you put so much in. You get out what you put in 10, 100 fold. So you always ask for the feedback. You always ask, kind of pick your brains over this and over that. And I think that's really important as a mentee or the person being coached is that you you challenge, you ask questions, you make the most out of it because it's you know there is a direct correlation between what you ask what you do and the results that you get so you need to take massive credit for that as well and I don't know whether that reminds you of the phrase that we literally live by within our speaker academy which is the feedback is the breakfast of champions champions I'll finish it off with there feedback is the breakfast of champions we can self-critique we're very It has been a while. We are very (laughs) self-critical. You know, we always pick up the faults and we'll do that even with this. You know, maybe I should have said this. I should have done this. I should have maybe brushed my hair. (laughs) 
<laughs> all of those things <laughs> and we pick up on the negatives but what we don't always pick up on is the positives and that's why external feedback is really really useful as well and why I love you know that you're getting your mentees to stand up and speak up and speak out in front of their peer group because they'll learn what to do and what not to do from one another as well so it's a great environment and I think mentoring and coach or coaching and education in general is is what makes the world go round. so yeah exciting times Definitely. I wholeheartedly agree. I don't think either of us from the education that we've had will be where we are without it. I know I definitely wouldn't. Um, Categorically not for me. And I I do love the fact, you know, Warren Buffett says the best investment you can make is in yourself at the end of the day, and it pays a dividend for a lifetime. So once once you've got the skill, it's always there to utilize. So for those that have listened, listened, um, where would you like them to come and follow you connect with you find out about any of the jv finance education or public speaking education or anything at all on those lines tony so um social i need to do a practice what you preach kind of thing so social media facebook is my kind of weapon of choice but i'm on facebook instagram i have a podcast which has been on pause for a long while so i suppose you're hearing it here first i'm going to be relaunching that in 2023 um so any of the social media channels my handle is the same on all of them i'm tony gorg and and if i can help or support you in any way i'd love to thank you tony and we'll put links in the show notes to all of that and if you do want to hear how tony convinced her children to brush their teeth and the (laughs) the template that she used it is on the podcast because i have listened um but we are the pro podcast Uh, And I came up with pro because perseverance leads to results, which creates opportunity. What does being a pro mean to you? Being a pro means sharing the good and the bad, in my opinion. Being a professional is someone who prepares, shows up and doesn't just show up physically, but shows up in every area. Share the good, share the bad and stand up and stand out. That's being a pro in my world. Amazing. Love that. And thank you very much indeed for for coming on the show, for being a mentor in speaking and life and business and various bits and giving up your time today and being the first podcast that you've been on in the whole of 2022. I I am grateful. So thank you very much indeed for, for sharing 45 minutes with us this morning, Tony. An absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.